I hope for you. Which brings me to the few introductory words about Björn Brems. He is currently a professor for neurogenetics at University of Regensburg, mainly working with Drosophila behavior and learning. And if I look at his CV, that has been his main focus already since the diploma thesis, which he did in 96 at University of Würzburg, and where he also did his PhD, which he finished in 2000. And then he moved to um, Texas for a postdoc position on an Immunota grant and came then back to work in Berlin for a couple of years at the Free University, um, where he also got a Heisenberg Fellowship in 2009, still continuing on Drosophila work, um, after then landing the, his professorship at University of Regensburg, where he still is. If you look at his publication record, it's very active in the neurogenetics of Drosophila behavior. Several very highly cited papers are there. If you look at the two most cited papers, perhaps, they deal with very general topic. And the first one, it's about redefining statistical significance. And this is a topic we all discuss with our labs and uh, with everybody. So this is cited over 1,700 times. And the, another highly cited paper, actually the one that brought me to attention of Björn's more general work, is entitled Deep Impact Unintended Consequences of Journal Rank. And I saw that on social media at some point, okay, there's somebody criticizing the credibility of high impact journals. This is interesting. And I think that's how we came into contact. And yeah, when you then learn what Björn is doing, he has been since many, many years, 15 years already, very active in discussing the publication business and criticizing our business model, highlighting issues. And I'm very grateful that you take the time now to share some of your uh, thoughts here with us. And I'm pretty, convinced that we ha will have an interesting discussion afterwards. So thank you, Björn. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's, uh, this is a topic, of course, that everyone can relate to, no matter what the field, almost no matter what the field, as long as the field is concerned with journals and usually with experiments. Um, uh, what is a little bit different this time is, and I don't recall how we ended up there, is that we're making an explicit, in the title already, an explicit connection uh, to the uh, to uh, the anti-science agenda. And of course, uh, I can share the screen now. Uh, let me see, here it is. So you should be seeing me right now, but for some reason now I see you. Okay, good. Um, so how our literature serves the anti-science agenda in terms of publish or perish. And of course, there are different kinds of anti-science agendas, right? So there's the anti-vaxxers that are very prominent right now, as they are in every pandemic, they come and go. And then you have uh, flat earthers, you have climate change deniers. So it's a kind of, what do I mean with, with the anti-science agenda? The ones that we're sort of familiar with here in Europe are the ones that are very particular. They, like they have a particular issue in science. They, they, uh, take issue with in the US, it's creationists, for instance. But that is not something that I find particularly threatening as a scientist. What I do find definitely quite a bit more threatening is a headline such as this one from 2016, when you, so before the pandemic, when you hear a scientist talk about peer review, you should reach for your Browning. This was published in a website called Breitbart. Um, and which is a political website. Um, and most, I, I've learned later for me, Browning is a clear uh, reference to something that I know, but I've learned later that not everybody knows what a Browning is. So I put a Browning here on the screen. Uh, this is a pistol. A Browning is a, a brand of a pistol. So essentially it means if you hear, if you hear a scientist talk about peer review, you should reach for your gun. So that's of course is something I find very alarming. And then um, when you look at that headline, you realize that it has something to do with a German, uh, or oh, pretty well known, uh, German Nazi theater play called Schlageter that was uh, first played at uh, the birthday of Adolf Hitler in 1933. And that has the line, a very famous line also, wenn ich Kultur höre, entsichere ich meine Browning. So not only is this a headline that is uh, calling for scientists to be shot, uh, it is also a reference to uh, a Nazi uh, idea, to a Nazi concept. 
And so what kind of website is this? Well, it's the website of Steve Bannon. And uh, you probably uh, all have heard of this guy. You can see him here with his uh, uh, boss at the time. He's an advisor to Donald Trump. So he sits in the, he sat, sat in the highest levels of U US government and he clearly wasn't alone and his uh, ideas about science have clearly had an impact on Trump. If you look at what Trump tried to um, get through uh, with his budget proposals is that uh, in 2017, massive cuts to science and medicine in Trump budget. He didn't, um, he tried, but he didn't succeed. Of course, next time around when the next budget came, 2019, Trump seeks big cuts to science funding again. And uh, Trump is not alone. His entire uh, government was set up to curb science funding, to stop public money to go into science. His budget director, uh, Mick Mulvaney, asked before he got into the government, do we really need government funded research at all? So the, what I would call the anti-science agenda as with a, with a V as in the one that is the most threatening to all of us as scientists is this one. It's the one that aims to stop public funds from going to science. And so this is really working very well, as you could see, sorry, if you could see here, uh, Zika science is so on science is so uncertain, we shouldn't bother to fund it, right? So that's the point the uncertainty in science is the one is taken here as an argument as this is the reason why we shouldn't be funding this. Now, if you look at uh, this Wired magazine article from 2018, science's reproducibility crisis is being used as political ammunition. So the point here is that anything about reproducibility in science is being used to promote this science agenda. So the point I'm trying to make here is that the way we do science provides ammunition, provides political ammunition for the people who want to defund science. It means that we are promoting our own enemies. So that's the point I'm trying to make, and I'm not alone in doing this. This uh, Wired article is only one. Here's another article where Naomi Oreskes was talking about the uh, reproducibility debate and that it has already been exploited by political activists. These guys are loving it. Oreskes, a historian of science at Harvard, told me, anytime scientists themselves admit there's a mistake or a problem, they're all over it. They have a feeding frenzy because this is exactly what they want and what they want to do is to use this now and try to discredit all science. So where did all of this start? One of the starting points is a publication by John Ioannidis, who now came back with a vengeance in the pandemic in a not so uh, interesting or not so uh, commendable way. But in this case, he published one of the most cited articles uh, in this field for uh, a very long time published in 2005, why most published research findings are false, where he looks at statistical evaluations and says, well, you know, if we take statistical um, variability into account, less than half of the content should be reproducible. So that's a prediction that he made just from statistics alone. And things like these uh, expanded beyond just scientific debate. You see here The Economist, how science goes wrong. The BBC reports most scientists can't replicate studies by their peers. You know, this is maybe a little bit exaggerated. Nearly all of our medical research is wrong. I don't think it's quite that extreme, but uh, you may have seen this one in Germany. So it's not just an, an, an English speaking phenomenon. Fusch in der Wissenschaft. Do you trust scientists? Ranga Yogeshwar was asking. So where is that coming from? Well, there have been a number of studies early on since uh, the seminal paper by John Ioannidis. And they have looked at, they have done similar things. They have either looked at method sections and looked at, okay, how likely is it that I can reproduce this work? And this is where you have the large numbers here of 238 or 257. They looked at the method section and said, well, here are these and these are these reasons why this work cannot be reproducible, but they didn't do the reproduction. So those are not so useful. Those, uh, this is also one like those, I think. And here you have a study. I'll explain what the y-axis means in a second. 
And here you have two studies that were done in companies where they said, well, you know, 87 or 89 percent of the experiments from the literature that we, that we were interested in reproducing because we wanted to um, make a drug, we failed to reproduce them. And this is what is on the y-axis, the prevalence of irreproducibility. So the higher this is, the more irreproducible is the work. And all of these are above 50 percent, which is where John Ioannidis predicted they would be. Now, these were reproductions, but because none of the companies wanted to disclose what it is they were working on, we can't check those. So they're just as useless, so to say, as these studies. And so in, in, so in about 2009-10, people started doing real replication experiments. The first one that was published was the Open Science Collaboration in Psychology. And lo and behold, they're smack in the prediction. So 2005, Ioannidis predicted less than half would replicate. Then in the following years, people did similar analogous studies and, and companies did replications. They also find less than half is replicable. The first real replication uh, uh, project finds that out of 100 psychology experiments, only um, 39 are replicable. Now there have been other replication experiments with varying results. For instance, in the social sciences, uh, if you look here at the base factor, the larger it is, the more likely it is that uh, the H0, the null hypothesis, can be rejected. Here, 13 out of 21 could successfully be replicated, all of them in science and nature. Um, so again, not much more than half, but they all seem to hover around these 50%, some a little bit lower, some a little bit higher, for various reasons. You can look at economics, 11 out of 18 studies, this is essentially this, this point here, just over 60%. There are other measures that they look at. So you see some of those measures are also below 50%. But if you just look at, you know, did they get the same effect at a significant rate? Also about 61%. Then maybe a little bit closer to biology. In general, even though it's not organismic biology, this is cancer research. In 2013, they announced to reproduce 50 high impact experiments in cancer biology. And in 2017, the first five were published and only two of them were successfully replicated. The year afterwards, this project, the people working on this project admitted that out of the 50 they tried to reproduce, they could only even start 18 experimentally for various reasons. So all the other experiments couldn't either be done because the antibody wasn't available anymore one of the authors didn't remember a crucial technical detail. Um, a cell line went extinct or changed its properties in ways that made it impossible to do the experiment. So there's probably as many different reasons why these experiments could not even be started as there are um, experiments. So only 18 of 50 can even be started to be experimentally reproduced. Let that sink in for a moment. 36% is not is only possible. Everything else you don't even have to try. Now this year, all experiments were finally done. Out of those 18 that were possible, five were successful. So if you take an extreme point, you have in cancer research, you have 10% reproducibility. Now, seven were partially successful. Two were not interpretable because the controls uh, apparently didn't show what they were supposed to show. And four were absolutely not reproducible. So if you take the opposing extreme position, four out of 50 were not reproducible. And if you take you know, a middle position, you say, okay, I had five successful, seven partially successful, two not interpretable, so we don't know what happened. So it's about half nine, right? So you can take five plus four makes nine, about half of those 18 that were experimentally possible because it could be that all the other ones may also be successful. So we can only, we only have those that were technically feasible. And of those 50%, you could count at roughly um, replicating. And again, you're at that 50%. So from that data, what that would mean if you could, which is impossible to know, but if you could generalize these 50% to all of science, it would mean that every other paper you read is not reproducible. That to me, I find dramatic. Um, if I would think that half of my papers would not be reproducible, it 
beyond dramatic, I don't even know what adjective to use, that would be catastrophic. And so clearly people differ in the expectations that they have of how reproducible science should be in general. I would say commonly people think that their own reproducibility is higher than the one of science in general, <laughs> for the probably the same reasons people think they're above average drivers. And probably, uh, anyway, let's not go there. But uh, I think 50% is clearly below any kind of standard we should aim for. In, no matter how, no matter what we do, 50% should is, is clearly too low. So um, the question now is then, of course, because we talked about peer review, this is about publishing. So how reliable is then that work? Because these people you saw, this, these reproducibility experiments are done for high impact papers, high impact journals. Maybe this is the upper bound. So maybe all the other research that's published in other journals is even worse. So that the average across all the journals is much, much below 50%. Now, that seems to be not the case. I have, there are, so there are a whole bunch from the, over the last 10, 15 years, a whole bunch of studies that look at uh, reproducibility, quality, methodological design of works, published works in various journals. I'll only pick three illustrative ones. Uh, the other ones are, for instance, in the paper that um, Robert mentioned in the beginning. What you see here, and in all three of them, what you see essentially is you see a measure of uh, journal rank uh, on the, or, or journals in general, not necessarily journal rank. Sometimes, as in this case, journal rank just comes out on its own. But you see journals on this, on the x axis, and you see some measure of quality uh, on the y axis. In this case, this is from crystallography experiments where you can actually quantify the quality of the computer model of the molecule protein or whatever that comes out of it. So every little dot on this uh, graph is one computer model that has been published in the journals that you see on the x-axis. And uh, what is plotted is the difference from average quality. And so they can measure absolute quality, for instance, by comparing the bond distances that are reported in the model compared to those, how they have to be. Like a, a CC bond has a certain distance. And if the model doesn't reproduce that, then you didn't work as well as you could have. And this is just one of several criteria that also takes complexity into account and these sorts of things. And then you take for each journal, you take the average of all the models published in this journal, let's say the European Journal of Biochemistry and or here in cell and you plot them and what you see in black is the average and this is the entire pool is average to zero and everything above is above average so is and the the, the, the quality measure is a distance from perfect. Uh, so if the, the smaller the value is the closer to perfect your model. So the, the better you have worked. And what's painted in color is significant difference from average. And so everything in blue is significantly better than average. And everything that's colored in red and has an asterisk is significantly worse than average. Well, and what you find, what is significantly worse than average is cell science, uh, nucleic acid research, nature, EMBO journal, PNAS, and so on. And what you find is significantly better than uh, average is European Journal of Biochemistry, biochemistry, so specialized journals, Acta Crystallographica, Crystallographica, these things that are catering precisely to this and have specialized editorial boards that do nothing else all day than look at these things. So in this case, it seems to be the opposite. The higher up the rank you go, the worse the quality of the work that is being published there. Now, this is from my field, this is from neuroscience. Here we see no effect at all. You see impact factor on a logarithmic scale on the x-axis, and this is statistical power. Damningly enough, the convention for statistical power is 80%. If you do an experiment, you should power it. That means you have a sample size that's big enough to reach a statistical power of 80%. This is not even close to being reached in this field. And even the ones that have the highest impact over here 
half of the articles, each, each one is an, is an article, um, half of the articles have decent um, power, but only one of them actually reaches the 80% criteria, right? And essentially what it means is that the person who does this research has a higher chance of getting a job than the person who does that kind of research. So you can see here already, right? You're not necessarily rewarding by, you know, by asking people to publish in these journals and by hiring people that publish in these journals, you're not necessarily rewarding reliable work. And finally, uh, errors as well. So you saw crystallographic quality, you saw metho methodology, and then it's just plain errors. So, so what happens when you make a mistake? And so what, what came out uh, last year is that because Microsoft Excel converts gene names, so when you, you, are bio, you, you work bioinformatics and you paste your genes that you found in your, with your tool that you programmed, you paste them into Excel so that you can upload it to uh, science, to your paper, and upload it with your paper. Um, what my Excel does is it changes them to dates or something like that. It tries to recognize what it is and changes it by itself. And because it's easier to change the gene names than it is for Microsoft to change Excel or for users to change, uh, to use Excel in a way that makes it. So they change the human names, the gene names, so that to try to avoid these errors. But before they did that, someone uh, went and checked how common are these errors, right? Which essentially mean that users just copy and paste their results in Excel without looking at them again. Right, which is just simply sloppy work because you, you can avoid that sort of thing. And what they find is that the overall average uh, of how often that happens is, is about one in five papers where you, that have such an Excel attachment, one in five has that. And if you look at those that were above this average or below this average, the average impact factor of the journals up here is higher than those of the journals up here. So again, people work more sloppy if they have published or you know, if they're submitting to um, a high impact journal than when they submit to a lower impact journal or at least if they work the same then mistakes are caught more often in the lower impact journals so no matter what you look at quality um, methodology or how sloppy people are working what you find seem to be finding is that either the high impact journals are no better than all the other journals so these things see no effect and in some cases, two of which I've showed, in some cases you see a uh, inverse effect such that the higher journal, higher level journals publish lower reliable, lower quality uh, work. And as of now, there isn't really, there's only one peer reviewed paper that shows the opposite direction. And that this is where people looked at duplicated images. So duplicated images are less common in higher impact journals, but this may just be because they have more money and have uh, duplication detection software or something. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, nearly all of the literature goes in this one direction and there's only one instance that goes in the other direction. So that means that the high impact journals, they attract the most unreliable science. And as we all know, publications in the high impact journals are precisely the things that get you ahead in science. Now one cannot look, and I think so, this is where we support the anti-science agenda by keeping a system afloat that rewards unreliable science and punishes reliable science. And so by doing this, we're providing ammunition to the anti-science politicians. But one cannot look at this reliability issue separated from two, at least two, probably more, but at least two other issues that have to do with our infrastructure. And those journals are our, infra, they're our publishing infrastructure. And there are two related problems. It's an affordability problem. It means that the infrastructure has become so expensive that we lack the funds to fix the reliability. Fix the reliability problem is to provide additional functionalities that makes it easier for us to check the science that we try to publish. And so the affordability problem and the functionality problem are very intricately connected to the reliability problem because if we can fix the affordability and the functionality problem, if we could fix that, 
then we would have the means to fix the reliability problem. And so that's why I will briefly go into and try to speed up a little bit now uh, into the affordability problem. Start with that. So quite recently, Nature came out and said, well, if you want to publish with us in open access, you have to pay uh, more than 10,000 euros for one article. Uh, and that is quite dramatic because if you look at the costs, you can ask publishers. You I have here a list of a list of publishing service providers in the bottom. If you ask them what their costs are of publishing an article, you see it's a uh, you have costs of, of submitting the article, getting a DOI, detect plagiarism, uh, normalize the bibliographic references, produce XML, PDF, print, EPUB, HTML, and so on, indexing, and so on. You only have they only have a cost of two hundred dollars. And so clearly, some journals are more expensive than others. It depends on how you calculate these things, right? Clearly, Nature will be more expensive than a preprint article, for instance, because certain things just are not be being done with a preprint article. Um, and so one can ask, OK, where, how can they ask for so much money when the costs are clearly not even close to 10,000? That much we can say. Um, we have looked into costs the highest cost that a nature article could incur, that an average nature article could incur would be about $1,000 if we take those calculations that we did for the other publishers. Now, the historical reason is that what the publishers are trying to do, they're trying to get to the same income, the same revenue via open access that they had via subscriptions. And subscriptions were essentially impossible for libraries to cancel because it would mean, would have meant back then that we wouldn't be able to read. And if we can't read, we can't work. And so you could say in, 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 in a, a slight change to the publish or perish mantra, the libraries always thought, well, it's read or rot. And so they thought, well, we have to pay what the publishers ask of us because every article is only in one journal. If I need this biology journal, it doesn't help that I have competition from a physics journal. And what's the consequence of this? What you see here is the years from 1986 to 2008. And uh, these figures uh, change somewhat after that because the business model diversifies when you get open access charges. So for historical reasons, I'm just going to show this. And this is the change in uh, uh, the difference in, in price compared to this start point here in 1986. And this uh, green one here uh, in the middle is the con consumer price index, so it's inflation. And so you see over the 25 years here, it all about doubles. Well, if the prices for subscriptions, they go up to about 400%. And the number of journals doesn't really change all that dramatically over this time, which is of course understandable because the publishers can ask what they want because there's no competition. And the libraries can't cancel because otherwise the faculty can't work. And that's of course, it's a perfect, if you're a shareholder at a, at a publisher, that's a perfect situation because no competition and you can charge what you want. And it's the public purse that pays, right? So we all know uh, from certain building a, a construction projects in Germany, we all know how easy it is for the public purse to just pay 11 billion if the uh, initial price tag was only 3 billion. And I think, uh, Berlin has some idea of where these uh, funds can go, can go when you have a public building project, public construction project. But we as authors, so I was talking about libraries paying so much, but what could they do? Now, the hope in 2008, you see why the 2008 is an important, is, is, around that time is an important point. People thought, well, but authors, surely authors, they would be more price sensitive. So if we make uh, authors pay, then they will see this is much too expensive and they will choose the cheaper option. And you can see here, first I'll show you an example and then on the right, uh, I'll cite the, uh, the aggregate data. What you see in blue is the submission um, articles and the articles published, sorry, not submitted, but published for plus one. Uh, at the time when we looked at this, it was, um, uh, you paid uh, $1,495 uh, for publishing there. And then in 2011, scientific reports came online. At the time in 2011, we joked that it's a clone of PLOS One, but because they even used copy and paste 
uh, words to describe their journal. So scientific reports and PLOS One are essentially the same in terms of how, they, how the publishers describe this journal. We publish everything as long as it's methodologically sound, we don't value impact or anything at all. If it's good, we publish it. That's essentially the, the point. And what you see, but it's $200 more expensive almost. And yet authors choose the more expensive uh, option such that in 2017, more authors publish there. Why is that? It's because if you look at the URL of scientific reports, it says nature.com slash CIREP because it's a nature journal. Uh, they just were afraid that the stuff they published there is so bad that they didn't want the nature name on the scientific report when they launched it. But apparently for us authors, just having nature in the URL, if we can't put it, people can't put it on their CV, of course, because it's not nature scientific reports, it's scientific reports. But just having nature in the URL is worth $200. And if you then, uh, in 2019, it was published uh, an analysis of the price development in APCs, it was shown that yes, if we as authors can pay for a more expensive journal, then we will pay because we assume explicitly or implicitly um, that paying more means more prestige. So we're not paying for publishing services, we're paying for prestige. And then of course, the more you pay, the better. So this is not going to change the affordability problem. One might ask, what are they doing with that money? So if you take all of these prices and if you take essentially everything we pay to the publishers in any shape or form, and we divide it by the number of articles we publish, then we know what we pay in general, totally over the whole world. And this number is fairly constant for the last 30 years and it ranges between four and $5,000 per article. And uh, so to make it uh, more conservative towards the publishers, this is an example that's calculated with $4,000. And if you take publicly available profit postings, which are about 30% uh, in, in the publishing industry here, then you see that of the 4,000 we paid, 1,200 go towards profits. Then one can use the market rates for publishing services and calculate what an average article costs. It's about 600 to make, right? I said between 200 and 1,000 and the average would be around 600, which means that the publishers are getting $2,200 per article that have nothing to do with publishing or profit. And so one may ask, where does this go? This goes to a lot of things um, uh, that I can't go into detail, but one thing stands out because it because some of those things don't concern us. It's like management costs some, some publishers, 4% of their publish of their revenue goes towards uh, paying the top 10 executive directors, right? And uh, so some of those editors make almost a million dollars a year. Um, and uh, some of them pay journalists to have their own uh, reporting of scientific science policy uh, and, and write big articles and that sort of thing. Um, but the thing that stands out because it um, contacts all of us is what concerns all of us is that they don't really put that money into functionalities, right? It's not that submission has become easier in the 10 years or so, and it's not that uh, the, the publishers have invested heavily in making science more reliable. So for instance, uh, just the other day uh, on uh, October 19, what, three days ago, I talked with Elizabeth Bick, which uh, uh, you might know, um, who's very, very famous for spotting duplicated images. And she's one of the authors also of the uh, work I talked about recently. And she said that, wouldn't it be nice if scientific publishers would be spending some of the millions of dollars we pay them on hiring staff to screen manuscripts for errors and fraud and to quickly deal with concerns raised about published papers, like decent quality control, right? And she knows a thing or two about how journals really are not interested in quality control. She tries to raise issues and the journals just say, no, no, it's not so bad. Um, so what are they spending money on? And if you look at what they have been investing and acquiring, if you look at the companies they have acquired um, over the last years, then one of the things that you see is that they uh, have acquired tracking technology. So if you go, depending on from where and when you go to, let's say, nature, you have either 21 
trackers that check what it is that you're doing on the nature website or you have 34 that's also nature website and pretty much i think the same the same article or you have 73 so there's a lot of technology on their platforms that checks what you're doing and this may seem like well who cares what i do well the thing is if you're in the same network with your cell phone then the kind of aggregation software that they've also invested in, some of them have also, some of them have also invested in, uh, can try and link your behavior on a nature website to the behavior that you have on your phone on something that's completely unrelated to your work. Um, and this is this has been such of, of such concern that the DFG recently this year um, has uh, written uh, a paper on the problematic and of, on the issues that this raises, uh, especially here in Germany, but for scholarship generally, but especially in Germany, because uh, free, academic freedom is in our uh, constitution. It's in article five of our constitution. And so this is starting to concern a great many people. And uh, what are the publishers doing with that data? Well, for one, they're selling it. This kind of data is, is you can monetize it, especially if you aggregate it such that uh, you have uh, if you use a computer at home, if you use a cell phone and a tablet and a computer at work, the software that can aggregate these four different um, end uh, uh, devices and can connect them to a single user is, of course, very valuable. And so they sell it. Another thing that they do is they want to expand the monopoly, right? I said when they publish, of course, they have a monopoly because this article is a thing. Every article is a single monopoly because you can't get it anywhere else. And this is what they have here, what was marked here in the middle, the publication monopoly that they already have. And what they've, another thing besides the uh, surveillance uh, software that they have on their own publication websites, what they have is tools that cover the entire workflow from discovery, when you find the literature, to analyzing your data, to writing the paper, publishing it, and then to outreach later or assessment with uh, pure or plum analytics or the nature index, these sorts of things that can aggregate citations and that sort of thing. So what you see here is that Elsevier and Holtzbrink with Digital Science and Springer Nature are leading here. They're covering the entire scientific workflow. And of course, every single one of these tools also collects data, right? So, which means that both Elsevier and Holtzbrink now, if you use these tools, know precisely what is happening in science from the very beginning when people start reading to how people search and what they're looking for, what they read and how long, how they, what they use when they generate data and what the kind of things are, how they interact with their data. And then when they write them, what's in the papers that in the manuscripts that they write, right? And so this is all quite concerning. And this is essentially where a lot of the money that we've been paying them is going. So when people now argue, as, as they often do when I criticize journal rank in saying, they often say that, well, what should we, what else should we use besides journal rank? And then now that we see what they're doing, the kind of data they collect on us and say, well, you know, uh, you just have to ask Holzbring or Elsevier. They know precisely what you are doing and they know precisely what uh, the candidate who's applying for your job has been doing in those last five years that is relevant for your evaluation. It's only that, you have to pay for it to get it, which means that we paid the publishers for publishing our articles such that they could develop surveillance tactics and then sell our own user data back to us such that we know uh, who we should hire as a professor and who we should kick out. That's uh, quite ironic because it's pretty much the same way how they're making money to begin with when we pay the public pays for the research that we do we do the peer review for them and then we pay again to get our articles back. And so we're right now we're in the process of doing the exact same mistake uh, that has concerned us for the last 30 years to do it exact the same way again uh, with our personal and research data and user data. Now, let me quickly, um, no, I'll have to jump over deal. We don't have time for this. I just wanted to show, to uh, emphasize how deal makes everything actually worse. Uh, if that's even possible, but I won't have time to do this. Um, so we'll jump to the next topic, uh, the functionality. So this is the affordability problem. The functionality problem uh, for everyone who deals with digital data, as we all do, uh, or nearly all do by now, um, realizes that clearly we don't just produce text 
right? We produce data, we produce code that we need to evaluate the data. In many cases, also we produce the code that we need to generate the data as if you're, if you're writing a simulation, uh, let's say a climate simulation, this, the code that where the climate uh, simulations run on are pretty important, I would say, among the most important scientific code you can think of. But uh, except for you know, these specialized areas, there's very little support for anything but text. So if you look at uh, our literature, right? We already talked about access being an issue. That's why we have open access, these sorts of things. So this is uh, obsolete paywalls. Journal prestige correlates with unreliability, right? We don't have scientific impact analysis. The peer review could be better in a lot of ways, both the way how it is done socially and the way it's conducted technically uh, and so on. Transparency is issues. There's no effective way to sort, filter and discover, right? I mean, um, uh, anyway, I won't go into too much details. If you look at all of this, uh, most of it will, will ring true to you in one way or another. Essentially, uh, not a whole lot has changed on the way we interact with the literature since 1995. And essentially, if we carved our papers in stone, took a picture with our cell phones and put them online, probably the functionality would not change all that much to what we have now. Data, this is a 10 year old study um but uh, it's probably still correct more or less that most of the data whoops sorry most of the data that we have is with us very little is in structured databases or published it's getting more and more i would say but still a lot of it is here and is not very secure uh but let's look at this part that is so, so officially supposed to be safe this tip of the pyramid well, it's not quite. So already since the 1990s, you see here, Swiss prod should have been 10 years old in 1996, but it may disappear in June 1996, due to funding problems. So these important databases have been facing funding issues for as long as they exist. So, and you, it, you know, not a year goes by that one of the big uh, journals with use of their uh, journalists that we pay uh, like Jocelyn Kaiser, report on a funding resources, funding for data resources uh, being in jeopardy. And uh, so the main issue here is, of course, that we have recurring funds, infrastructure funds that just keep flowing for subscriptions that we really don't need anymore. Um, but for these things without which we can't work, like the databases, without those, we can't work. For those, we have to get project data. And if the project runs out and the funder decides not to pay it anymore, it's gone. This is completely absurd, which means that if you look at the data availability and you assess it, you find that the availability of research data declines with article age. The older the article gets, the more unlikely it is uh, that you can get uh, the data that you used to be able to get upon publication, simply because where the authors published their data doesn't exist anymore. And if you thought, oh, there's a soft software, sorry, there's a typo in the title. Um, if you think the situation for text and code data is really bad, look at code. Since 19, oh, and there's, I, I forgot to make this in, in, in English. Since 1953, this is a computer from 1953. And since then, it's been standard that scientists that develop code share the code with each other. And since 1953, to this day, there is no institutional support for that sharing of code between researchers. The only thing that is what people use nowadays is GitHub, which is owned by Microsoft. So it's not institutional. So it's just a private company that people are using. And we all know what happens if Microsoft turns out to not like GitHub, because we saw uh, in, uh, I think it was last year, Microsoft just closed its bookstore. And guess what happened? If you bought a book, in the Microsoft bookstore, it was gone. So you bought it, but because they closed it, it was gone. And you, this was reported in several news. So it's essentially, it's just gone. So if Microsoft decides GitHub is not worth keeping up anymore, all the scientific code that's on GitHub and that's available to us, that's linked in the papers to that link to GitHub is gone. It's also funny uh, now that the, um, pandemic has hit 
the University of Regensburg, for instance, is following suit with many other institutions that have local Git repositories, right? It's called GitLab. Uh, and because the university is paying so much, in our case, it's 2 million every year for subscriptions and other payments to publishers, they don't have enough money to get a licensed version. So when I ask them, hey, I want to have my GitHub where everybody is and where I link my software to from the papers, because GitHub was there before GitLab came, I want to link this to GitLab such that they're always synchronized. So I can work locally in GitLab and then have GitHub have everything mirrored there on GitHub, GitHub. And if GitHub gets too old and someone invents something new and this is where everybody is, well, then I just mirror everything there and it's fine. I just work locally, but the library takes care of everything. That's where the archive also is and interaction can happen to whatever happens after GitHub. Well, they write back to me and say, well, sorry, we didn't have money for uh, a paid GitLab version. We took the cheap one that doesn't cost anything and that doesn't have the pull mirroring function that you want. So it is a clear, this email shows you right away how uh, the affordability um, has a direct impact. The affordability problem has a direct impact on the functionality problem. And of course, if it makes it difficult for us to share data and code, it has a direct aspect, direct effect on the reproducibility effect. And that's how a reproducibility issue. And that's how all three have to be seen together and have to be solved together. So how do I propose now that I'm, ooh, I'm three minutes over, but I'm already at the end. Um, how do we tackle the reliability, affordability, and functionality problem. We, talk, we, we tackle it at its root. And uh, you may think this is a radical approach, but the root is precisely in, 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 in Latin is radix. And so of course, if you tackle the root, you're being a radical. So if you think tackling a problem by its root, you're being a radical. Uh, and so in this case, I took, because this is uh, something that's uh, uh, to our benefit, I took the, article, the per article cost of $5,000. I said, right, it varies between four and 5,000. So for this example, I take the 5,000 upper limit and take the service costs that we would have for an article if we published it, let's say we just publish it like a regular paper, but we don't use publishers, we use competition, right? So everybody publishes it, let's say on their own server. And we have a system that hooks up all the servers. So we have one nice scholarly literature where we can find everything. But each little bit of the literature is being taken care of our employers, just like electricity and water and, and our furniture is taken care of by our employers, right? So this is such an important infrastructure that should be taken care of just as water and electricity is. And if we do that, we get to about 200 euros or dollars. And if you calculate that for the number of articles that we publish, you have not quite $10 billion every year that we would save. So we would have, if we would do that like this, if we would say, hypothetically speaking, we want to get rid of journals because they promote unreliability, we want to have competition, so we have affordability. And with that money that we save, um, we want to buy functionalities, right? If that's what we want to do, this is what we would get. We would get 10 billion every single year. Honestly, I have no what 10 billion US dollars can buy. So I looked up what are the most crazy scientific experiments and how much do they cost? The International Space Station takes about 3 billion, if you average building and, and maintenance, takes about 3 billion per year to run and build. And the LHC in Geneva costs about 2 billion per year. So we can build, we have twice that to build ourselves an infrastructure that takes care of text data and code in a, in a way that we don't have anything to do with it anymore. It means just we can focus on uh, taking care of our experiments, writing our code, collecting data and everything in terms of publishing and making archiving and curating someone else does with that kind of money. We don't have to worry about it anymore. We don't have to upload something to any, to any kinds of um, um, servers that may go down, nothing. Everything would be automated easily, right? So we have substitutable services. If we don't like the service provider, we can change it. We can get, to, we can get competition, which means that how we can get uh, to this low price. The authors don't have to pay anything. If there's something about our journals that we like, because this is digital technology, we can just copy it. Anything we like about our journals and want to keep, well, we keep it. The solutions for data and code, because we save so much money are cost neutral. We don't have to find extra money for it. 
We don't have to force anybody to use it. We just say, well, you know, you can publish here for free or you can pay 10,000 euros for a nature paper. Fine, up to you. But if we don't pay nature anymore, a large chance is nature won't be around for long. And if nature isn't around, nobody can ask, oh, you have to have a nature paper to work with us if nature doesn't exist, right? So if there's no journals, there's no need to judge journal quality. We don't have to worry about journals and so on and so on and so on. And of course, if we build something like this, of course, everyone has access, that's for sure, but that's a side effect way down the road. Um, this has been a dream for a long time, for about 10 years. The first people to propose that sort of thing have published articles with these proposals in the 1998 or so. But now, since about four or five years, there actually are uh, alternatives. So there's a place called Open Research Central, and they have uh, uh, platforms like Welcome Funded Researchers, Gate Funded Researchers, or now also Open Research Europe. So if you're Horizon 2020 funded, you can publish there for free. And uh, many, many other organizations are there now. And that's one example of how if every institution just has their papers in their one in their place, and of course, if you have multi-author ones, then you have many copies of the papers. Yeah, that's what you want, of course. You want to have it resilient such that half of it can go offline and the other half still have 100% of the content. Um, and you can still find with one search box, you can still search all of them. So you have one literature in one place that just follows a standard and then you can do this and it's all there. So we don't even have to invent something. It just has to happen. How can it happen? Uh, well, what would the end, sorry, before we can go to the last slide about how it can happen is what we would have then. We would have a system of interoperable digital research objects, text, data, code, the pre-registrations, interpretations, the materials that we do, management plans, review and quality control would all be done on that network, can be searched in text mined. Publication happens when all authors have hit their publication button. There's all kinds of models for post-publication review. You can get contributorship, not just for publishing articles, but for all kinds of other things. Open to everybody, uh, you know, the list goes on. So that would be the end result of this, that people described for the first time uh, more than 20 years ago, and that now has become feasible because the frameworks exist, they're there. We don't have to use ORC, we can just use something different. If we don't like ORC, we just use something else. But that's an example that already exists. And how could you get there? Well, we could have built something like this or started building it 30 years ago, right? We started with archive with the physicists. And so we could have built this a long time ago. So that we didn't do this shows to me that our institutions don't have a very strong inclination of doing this. Our employers should be paying for this, but they're not. Which means I would say now after waiting for 30 years that they do it, I think it would be crazy to wait another 30 years that maybe if we wait longer, maybe they change their mind and start paying for the things that we really need. So what I think uh, one could be doing is since uh, in this case, Coalition S funders that I have listed here, they have seem to be, since they go together to say, oh, open access is so important when we already have access uh, via numerous ways. Um, maybe we can convince funders that the kind of system that we have here is to everybody's benefit. If science, if the science they fund becomes more reliable, cheaper to uh, check and with more functionalities to check, what's not to like about that? And uh, maybe they should um, then not force authors to do what they want, because authors are already forced to do all kinds of things. And many of the Plan S um, requirements go are risking careers of scientists. And so maybe it's time that these funders would apply the thumbscrews to institutions who have the money. We authors, we're not even paying directly the publishers. It's the institutions that pay the publishers. So the institutions should get incentives. So what publishers, what, what, what funders could be doing is they just change the eligibility criteria. I've linked the eligibility criteria here. They all say that, no, 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 you have to fulfill certain criteria if you want to have money from us. And they should put this decentralized system, this network, they should put this as a criterion. You have to be within this criterion and if within this system or you won't get funding from us. You could even, if you want to be really radical, you could say, if you still have subscriptions or APC payments, you won't get money from us. That would be a very radical approach, but you don't have to be that radical, right? These things, if you just start shifting money from the old system to the new shift system by, you know, one 
requirement after another being added, um, lots of money can shift and we don't need the 10 billion right away. It's fine if we get a 1 billion per year, that's still a lot more than we've had in the last 30 years for that kind of thing. So I hope that uh, I'm a little bit over time now, sorry about that. So I hope that um, I've been able to show what the main issues are that we're facing, uh, how we're contributing and providing ammunition to the anti-science agenda, and who would have to change what in order to ma start making sure that money goes away from the system that's really bad, right? That is uh, promoting the anti-science agenda to a system that does the opposite and tries to mitigate Nothing will ever solve these problems, but at least we should have a system that also demonstrates outside, to the outside, to everybody, not just uh, the public, but also especially politicians, that we're actually trying to do something about the problem. Thank you very much, and I'll go to uh, the question in the, uh, uh, in the chat box right away. Yeah, thank you very much, Bjorn. This is awesome. Um... Yeah, anybody wants to pose a question, either use the chat or raise the hand. I hope I can see this under, under the participant list. So first question by um, Jens, please. Oh, you're muted. Try again, sorry, super talk, fantastic. Thanks. Absolutely fantastic. I was thinking, is this an enormous movement? and? Wouldn't it be something to actually try to do on European level? Like the S3 roadmap is supporting uh, infrastructures to build huge networks and then let them uh, be on their own. Wouldn't the, that the, be, I mean, yeah. The larger the, the larger the organization that supports these shifts, the better, because 